would allow the Serbian Patriarch to have certain privileges on Serbian soil to govern the, uh, his community, and he, there, would, there was some uh, the right to government in temporal matters as well as religious matters. And those texts became known as the privileges of the Serb community. And these were the privileges that, in 1848, they now said, demonstrated that they'd always been given the right to a Vojvodina. So you can see, against all this political background, especially the events of the middle of the 19th century, you can see how the story of the so-called great exodus of Velika Seoba could have a special significance. The early privileges were constantly cited, and they were given a meaning which they simply did not bear. Um, the argument was that the Serbs had been invited to move to Hungary, and that the invitation was a, something like a treaty. It had status in international law. Uh, this was a claim that was made, which involved completely falsifying the first decree, which had said, do not desert your homes. Please stay there. We will come to you with our armies again, and we will liberate this territory. And when I say falsified, I mean falsified, because in the mid-19th century, they started publishing versions of this text, which instead of saying, non deserite, do not desert your land, it just said, deserite, <laughs> please desert your land and come to, come to Hungary. Um, but also there was a claim, as I said, that this was some sort of treaty arrangement between the patriarch and the emperor, and therefore the patriarch had always operated as a kind of political representative of a nation that had although not formally, but it had in some sense statehood. Uh, he was its political leader, and as a, as a national bloc, it had moved to Hungary. And therefore, it was not in the position just of refugees asking for some privileges. There was some treaty basis for its, its rights. You can see how important that was for the politics of the time. Now, of course, not long after that, from, I would say, the 1860s onwards, you have the development of a nationalist Serb historiography in Belgrade that is now arguing directly for a completely independent and sovereign Serbian state. And it has to look at these events and see how it can incorporate them into its narrative. Um, and so you have people there who start to look at the movement of Serbs to Hungary in a very different light. Because now Hungary is, or well, Austria-Hungary, from the late 1860s, is an oppressive power. And national irredentism aims at this Vojvodina territory, and it regards Austria-Hungary as the great geostrategic threat. So the story starts to change. And nationalists such as Panta Srečković start criticizing Arsenia, saying that he was tricked into taking Serb people to Hungary. And this was a terrible mistake. Uh, something he said hugely damaging to the Serb people. The great historian Stoyan Novakovic said, the alliance with the Austrians against the Turks is the only thing I can approve of. Everything else is hard to understand, and the migration is the most unfortunate thing of all. So now the migration has changed its character and has become some sort of oppressive act by Hungary, tricking the Serb people into becoming prisoners of the Hungarian Austro-Hungarian state. And they start rewriting the history to say, well, actually, they didn't um, become enthusiastic volunteers allied with the Habsburg forces in 1689, because the Habsburg forces were oppressive even in Kosovo. Why were they oppressive? Because they brought Jesuits and Catholic priests who were forcing them to become Catholic so that they would be assimilated to the Austro-Hungarian society. And so, very quickly, surprisingly, the story of national resistance switches 180 degrees, and the story is then that they were resisting the Austrians. And you find examples of this in the uh, nationalist Serbian writings from the late 19th century and in the early 20th, when the tensions between Serbia and Austria-Hungary are, of course, major, and in a sense, would lead directly to the First World War. Um, you find very strong writings of this kind. But there is another problem. If you're just concerned with writing this national story to criticize the Austrians, there's no problem about emphasizing that hundreds of thousands of Serbs were moved. Because A, this magnifies the deceit and the hostility of the Hungarians who tricked you into this, 
and B, uh, it magnifies um, the importance of getting back this imprisoned population that is now in the world of Dina. But a problem comes up. In 1912, when Serbian forces finally conquer Kosovo, because the whole justification for that was to say, we are reclaiming the land that is inhabited by Serbs. So here is a serious problem. They've been writing all their history books saying that Kosovo was emptied of Serbs. The Serbs left. Indeed, that was their explanation of why there was an Albanian population in Kosovo. It was that a vacuum was created in 1690 by this terrible exodus. But now, of course, irredentism for Kosovo you can't, irredentism means claiming the non-redeemed, the irredenta. The, you have to have some population there that needs to be redeemed. You have to claim there is a significant population of Serbs in Kosovo. Otherwise, the irredentism has no basis. So suddenly, the whole argument is thrown into reverse. And you find people writing, uh, particularly the great publicist Jovan Tomic, um, whose book, um, or Arnautina, who started Serbi in Sanjaku, that was translated into French and became probably the widest read text in Europe on Kosovo in this period, he writes, it's absolutely false that there was a great migration. Most Serbs remained in Kosovo. Why is he writing this? Not because he has examined the historical documents and discovered that the story was wrong, but because the nationalist uh, mythical pressure is now pushing in the opposite direction. Well, despite all the pressures of Serb nationalism, there were good historians in Serbia, people such as Aleksa Ivic or Mita Kostic, who wrote critical history of all these events, who studied the documents, and who added to our historical understanding. Uh, and on the whole, the tradition developed by those historians was getting most of the facts right by the late 20th century. But then, of course, came another political movement in Belgrade, uh, the period of the Memorandum of the Academy of Sciences, the period of the great petitions and uh, the campaign to demand the protection of the Serbs of Kosovo. And one of the elements that was always emphasized there was that they were leaving Kosovo in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, that hundreds of thousands were being driven out by pressure in the Albanians. So suddenly this idea of the great exodus had a resonance and a significance again. And in that period, you find a revival of the emphasis on the mass migration of the Serbs. And it was in reaction to that, actually, that uh, Skender Rizai, the Kosovar historian, Ottomanist, published an attack on the Serbian account, using his knowledge as an Ottoman historian to demonstrate that many elements of it were false. And strangely, that is almost the first, uh, the first statement of a, a definite opposing view by Albanian historians, because this whole episode for them had not been a major feature of their historical account. They had hardly bothered with it until it became such a, a sort of political pressure from Serbian intellectuals that they needed to have an answer to it. And although I could comment on some points of detail in Skender Rizai's um, argument, I think on the essential points what he wrote was correct. Well, let me finish there, because I think my time is up, but let me just summarize. The story I've told of this one myth, going into a little more detail about how these myths change and how they develop, gives you a whole gallery of examples of basic nationalist myths. Uh, because this story of the Great Migration and the relations with Austria-Hungary, it has the myth of massive uh, victimhood, the myth of being a, a historic victim, a repetition of the Battle of Kosovo. It has a myth of heroic resistance to outsiders. It has a myth of permanent nationhood uh, in a strong political sense that the Patriarch was actually representing that. <coughs> and it has the myth of a permanent right to a territory because their removal was, was forceful and unnatural, because it created a, a vacuum because the Albanians only came as a result of this, this so-called vacuum. But also you can see specific ideological pressures changing the story, particularly where the relations with Austria and Hungary are concerned. So at the beginning, this claim that there was a special relationship of equals as treaty partners in international law, which is part of that argument of permanent nation. But then the argument they were tricked by the Austrians, which is part of the argument of victimhood and 
and marketing. 